Jeff, happy to be here. This is exciting. Yes, man. I'm I'm glad we finally got to do this. I know we've been we've been uh, talking for a while about it, and and obviously you are a one of the 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 legends of poker. I mean, you got the WSOP title, WPT title, you know, over nine million in earnings. But you're more on the business side of things now, and haven't been kind of playing as much poker. But I still a lot of the diehards know who you are. So if if those that don't, maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what your poker background is, how you got into poker, and and just give us a little bit of a life story to start out here. Sure, man. Happy to do it. Yeah, I mean, I so I started playing poker in 2003, kind of with the with the first original poker boom. Um, I grew up in New York. I started, you know, started playing in underground games. Um, kind of, you know, quickly learned that there's, you know, something called online. I uh, started playing online. Then I, I, my my first live event was, uh, I think, around 2005. I went to first went to Commerce, then I went to Vegas, and I and I had my first kind of little taste of a taste of success. Um, I remember my my first kind of my first big event was like a 3K buy-in, and it was like 500 people or something, and I finished uh, fifth, and I cashed for like 25,000, and it was like massive for me. It was like you know I think it was probably like my probably like 80 percent of my bankroll. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was like built built right there. So that's kind of when poker really started to take off. Uh, it was um, I was just graduating. Uh, I just graduated college. Um, I got into uh, trading at the time, so I was kind of I was kind of balancing both uh, trading and poker um, okay. at the time, um, and you know, growth, grow, growing in both uh, in growth aspects. And um, around two thousand six, two thousand seven is when um, kind of I started to take off in both in poker and trading. But I started to really, really enjoy poker a lot more. I I also realized for me to to uh, to get to to where I really want. I have to uh, I have to choose one, so I just I just chose poker and I focused on poker um, for you know for the next uh, ten years or so exclusively. I you know I, I like the idea of uh, of having freedom. I like the idea of kind of uh, being able to travel everywhere. Um, and uh, you know w- one of the things that I really really enjoyed about poker, which I th- which I which I also think is very unique about poker, um, is the kind of people I got I got to meet. Um, and I think that's underappreciated because in you know when you're when you're dealing you know in businesses um you tend to meet people from you know similar similar upbringing similar similar ideas from that business but in poker you just meet people from from all sorts from all walks of life and that's yep. something really cool yeah that's um, absolutely that's uh, that is one of the treats and you know, it sounds like to your partner luca and you are formerly sponsored by poker stars i was there for a little bit you were there for a long time i think over five years and and, yeah. and got to meet you know again some of the what I find, and, and a lot of people I talk with, they're in poker, even less in poker now. And you find a lot of great relationships, and as you mentioned, you got people from just all different walks of life, all different businesses, all different social statuses or economic statuses. It's just very interesting. It's a melting pot. Yeah, you really get to meet a lot of good relationships. So uh, I definitely want to make sure we touch on on that. But you 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 were grew up in Ukraine and then came here to the U.S. and lived in Brooklyn. Is that right? Yeah, I grew up, well, I, I was born in Ukraine. I, I was I was in Ukraine until 10 years old. And then we, my parents uh, and I moved to the US. So I grew up in New York and uh, now I've moved back to Ukraine. Uh, I've been here for the last four years um, because because our business is in, is in Europe. Uh, but yeah, but basically most of my life I grew up in the US. That, that and, and tell me what that was like when you first came. Was it when you were 10 years old or when you came over? How was that the experience? Were you scared? And and what was it like when you when you left and, and came to Brooklyn? Yeah, yeah, it was actually it was it was I mean it was a it was obviously a little bit scary. I would say I mean uh, we had essentially like no money. We I mean my my dad was already in in, in the U.S. Um, uh, the also when we were leaving Ukraine, it was literally the day when the Soviet Union was falling apart. So and wow. obviously no no one knew what that was going to be like and. When me and my mom were uh, traveling to the airport, um, she she I mean I was a kid so I didn't really know but but she told me later that we didn't know whether whether we'd be able to leave safely because there were tanks surrounding the city uh, so we didn't know if it was going to be a violent revolution or not right um, but thankfully we were able to take off and I remember when we landed in uh, in New York um, we were met by a bunch of reporters and and then when I when we when my dad picked us up. I remember watching on TV and uh, watching a lot of people from our plane uh, shown on the news. Um, so it was a, you know, it was a pretty, pretty hectic time. Um, uh, then it, you know, took a, took a couple of years of adjusting, um, learning the language. Uh, as a kid, thankfully, you pick it up pretty quick. 
so English kind of became you know uh, became natural for me and um, yeah so that but, but I'd so say you overall were, you're, you're saying like when you went on the when you were actually on the way to the airport like when you were leaving the house I mean it was pretty intense like you didn't really know if you'd be able to get there easily if the plane would be allowed to leave like all that like it was like it was really like that 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 serious of a situation at that time you know what I remember is that we were leaving in the middle of the night. Like it was like late, late night, maybe two in the morning or something or three in the morning for some reason. That's the, I mean, obviously it's hazy, my memory, cause I, you know, I was, I was pretty young. Yeah. Um, but I remember it was really late. And I remember we got to the airport, there was a lot of people. And I think we waited for a long time and we didn't know whether we were gonna get on the plane. And even once we got on the plane, we didn't know if we were gonna take off or not. So uh, it was just a lot of confusion um, everywhere. And it was, it was, yeah, it was like, it was August, 22nd 1990 i think 22nd uh 1991 uh or 20th it was like literally the, the, the day that the soviet union fell apart so oh, wow. so I, le I left i left ukraine when it was still soviet union and then the next day it became ukraine <laughs> wow that's uh that, that's wild so okay so you make the u.s you're in there you grow up and you're in brooklyn and then how did you sort of get into games and, and at what age did you start to find poker and, and then start start playing other games or, or was it there, was it magic or anything before poker or was it the, for game wise that got you going in that direction? yeah it's a good it's a good question i yeah i love games all my life i i like i've always been a gamer i you know i started out um I think the very first game I remember when we first got a computer was a game called Golden X. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> it's, a, it's an ancient, ancient game. Um, then I got a Game Boy, and I was playing you know, a bunch of games there. But I would say the games that I became really passionate about and spent a lot of time on the first game was Warcraft 2. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that game. Of course. Um, and I spent a lot of time playing that, uh, you know, but back then the internet wasn't so good. So like, you know, there was a lot of weird, weird problems and there didn't, didn't have battle net, but I, you know, I played pretty high level. Um, and we had, we were like all these guilds and clans with my friends and all I did after school was just, you know, play these, play these games. Um, uh, so, you know, it was kind of one after the other, you know, after that, um, there, you know, there, there was uh, Dune, there was Command and Conquer, there, you know, a um, bunch of games. Um, then I think when I, once I went to college, I kind of started focusing more on, um, uh, on trading. I think trading is, you know, a, sense, a game in itself as well. And, you know, and then obviously once poker took over, that's the only game I focused on because I, you know, I loved it so much. I was really, really passionate about it. So, so was poker for you, it wasn't before college, you found it after college or during college, when did you first start playing competitively or for real money? The, my, my very first experience with, with poker was actually literally like a month before college ended. Um, I was just, um, I was just thinking, of, I, was just, I remember I was coming home and uh, a, a friend of mine called me and invited me to, to a home game. He said, you know, let's play some poker. And I was like, I don't know how to play, but you know, let's do it. Um, and you know, uh, I went over, I remember I lost like, uh, six bucks or something. And I, I still didn't even, I still didn't know the rules. I, even after I lost, I didn't understand what, what happened. Uh, but I really liked it. And then we just kind of all, of, you know, all the friends, we all kind of organized and we started running like once a week home games. And then those turned into twice a week, three times a week. And, um, yeah. And then, and then we found out that there's like, you can play with other people, there's underground games and then there's online and, you know. <laughs> And right. What, and what, what year was this? So 2003. So, so I think it was around May 2003 was when I first played my first hand of poker. Um, and home games were basically all of that summer and all of that fall. I, I remember I used to w watch the World Series of Poker. I would watch a lot of World Poker Tour, which was, you know, I think was just it was really big back then. Um, uh, obviously became fan of all the, you know, of all the poker superstars. Um, and, uh, I think, I think it took about a year before I started to, um, really consider trying to fly out and play some like professional poker, like go to a casino and play some poker, uh, because the, the nearest places to New York were, uh, it's either Atlantic city or you can go to like Mohegan sun or Foxwoods. Um, those are, those are the nearest. Um, but I remember, I think it was. I think it was when did Antonio win his um, commerce uh, WPT? Was that 2004. Yeah, so I think that was my first trip to comp to to a poker event. I actually didn't play. I remember I went with a with a couple of friends, um, and uh, one of my friends played the cash game that Antonio was playing in. It was like a 10 20 pot limit hold'em cash game. That was like the the big game back then. You know, the really yeah. really big game. 
And uh, <laughs> um, uh, I just remember that's, uh, I remember my friend who was also like really, really new to poker. He, I think he like got really lucky and like crushed Antonio for like a big portion of his bankroll. And then Antonio, and, you know, ended up like, you know, buying in anyways to, to the main event. And then, you know, and then, and then we were like cheering for him and he ended up going to, to win the whole thing. So yeah. that was kind of my first memory of, uh, of poker and uh, of, you know, like large stakes poker and what it could be. Um, I didn't have nearly, you know, enough of a bankroll to play anything like that back then. Um, but that's but that's kind of my first taste. That's hilarious because yeah, that story that is. I remember and Antonio's been on the podcast and one of my very close friends, and that is like his. That's like his his beginnings, and he really did put it all on the line. Like that tournament, I think he had the majority of himself, and he he did get rocked in that exact game, and then went and yeah, on like one point <laughs> four million the next day or I, something. That and was that was my that was my friend's dad who rocked him. <laughs> That's amazing. That's all. He literally didn't know how to play. He just rocked him. That's that's all. That's that's crazy, man. Small world, right? At some point, yeah. small world. Yeah. Uh, poker. All right. We see everyone joining in on Twitch. Good to see you guys. We are doing going to do a giveaway again with Mr. Eugene. We're going to have a uh, let's take a look here. We got the ask the questions on Twitter, and there's there's Eugene's Twitter. We're going to talk about GG Clash, the big portion of uh, this, which I have also invested in. Bill Helmut, Daniel Grani as well. So really cool team. Poker kind of. Combining a bit with the esports side, which you know is a wild world. Uh, we could spend hours on that alone. So we'll make sure we do get to some of that. And again, if you guys want to ask a question, you can enter for a hundred and eleven dollar giveaway, uh, which we will do at the end of the show, and we'll try to get to as many of these as you, we can. A lot of questions, and still time to get in that. Uh, but yeah, so so okay, so you get into poker, uh, and then when when did you all of a sudden now? So it wasn't long after. And like, oh, four, you go there. And now this was your first ever. And again, you got, you're in the club. I think out of the 120 whatever guests, the ones that have played poker, maybe about 100, like 96% first ever cash on the Hen Mob is a final table. So you you tick that box again. You take fifth. What was this like? What, had you played one before? Or was this literally your first tournament and you just got fifth? What, <laughs> what happened? So I'll tell you, this is actually an interesting story. So I, I, you know, I think at that time when I played this 3K buy-in, my whole, my whole bankroll was probably... I mean, it was probably like under ten thousand um, dollars. It was it was tiny, right? Uh, and I came. It was my first trip to Vegas. Um, and what I, at the time I didn't play tournaments. At the time I played mostly cash games. Um, and I remember I was playing. Maybe it was like the two five game, the two four, the two five game, or the one two game. I don't remember. I, I think it might, might have been the two five game. And I remember I won. I had three days where I won like a uh, thousand each day, which was like huge for me, right? Like I was like like bam, 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 and I, you know uh, I won like. Uh, I won like three grand in three days, and my friend, um, my friend Ilya goes, uh, "Why don't you go play this event? There's a there's a three K event starting up." And I was like, "No, no, no, that's that's way too big for me." Um, and he's like, "I'll just take half, just just whatever, just go for it, just raise fifteen hundred or whatever." I was like, "All right, let's do it. You know, whatever. I'm winning. You know, uh, I don't mind." Um, and yeah, so that, that's 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 kind of how you know uh, that was my first real poker tournament experience, and you know, <laughs> obviously getting fifth was insane. I also remember, like, I had a bunch of chips too on the final table. But, but anyways, like, um, you know, tasting that, it, it's some, it's like a drug, right? Like, you're like, wow, I, I really want to, you know, I really want to try that again. And then, and then, so after finishing fifth, I cashed for like forty seven k or whatever it was. Um, uh, there, there was the main event coming up. It was a fifteen k main event. And then my and then Ilya, and then my friend goes, "Why don't you play that?" And I was like, "Are you insane? I'm not. I can't. I can't risk 15k." He's like, "He just won." I was like, "Oh my god!" So so he's like, "Let's just you know, let's just go like uh, I don't remember if I had a third or half of myself." He's just like, "Let's go thirds so or let's go halves." Um, and I was like, "Whatever, let it ride. Let's you know, let's gamble." I always had like this this gam you know probably uh, a lot of gamble to me. Um, and I played that and I cashed that. So I even, I even doubled my money there. And I actually, that was my first experience playing with, uh, Phil Helmuth actually. That was, I remember I was really, really excited because, uh, you know, he was obviously like a big superstar that I, you know, I watched on TV and, um, it was really, really cool. Uh, so lots of memories from that event as well. Even, you know, even though I got busted out shortly after making the money, but it was just such a cool experience, you know, uh, making the money there as well. That's cool. And then look who won it, Mr. Negranu, who's uh, no slouch himself. And, uh, you know, he, yeah. just, uh, he's, he, he just seems to be there. He's been around. He's got the results. And how cool is that now to see Daniel and Phil in, involved with Clash? And, you know, I, I came on board recently uh, as well for a sweat. And, you know, I'm excited to be a part of it. Maybe it's a good time seeing him there at the, at the, at the, the podium, the, the winner's <laughs> circle. Tell us a little bit about Clash and what's going on and what, who all is involved with this. Sure. Yeah. I mean, obviously, like, 
once once my poker career took off and once my results started to come in, I you know I got to know many people in the poker world. I um you know I I got to know Daniel and Phil pretty well and um and you know throughout throughout the years and um also obviously my partner Luca we got we got pretty close um uh and uh, this was around 2013 or so that, that Luca Luca and I got pretty close I mean he was part of poker he was one of the original uh people uh with poker stars he was with them for a long long time and uh, and I realized we had a lot in common in the sense that, you know, we were kind of both gamers, even even before poker. Um, Luca was also uh, much more into business already than I was. I mean, at the time I was, uh, you know, I was mainly just like investing into business, but I didn't really understand anything about business. Um, I was still fully into poker. Um, but I did see, uh, I was already a fan of esports, I would say from around 2010 or 2011. Um, especially because of Elki, uh, as you may know, like I'm, I'm really good friends with Elki and, uh, you know, one of the times when we went to South Korea, he took me to a Starcraft event and that was so exciting. And, and, uh, and like, I was just mind blown as to, as to how popular and, uh, how big it was. Um, then I remember, um, in Vegas, I also went to a League of Legends event with Luca and, and the Mandalay Bay. And, um, I was just seeing how much, you know, how, how popular all this was growing and, um, right. Uh, and I started to see some similarities, you know, and, and then at the day, you know, these are just games, just like, just, you know, uh, just like poker, I mean, with different characteristics, but, uh, but it's, it's still just competition. And, um, and with, with the way that I saw the world was evolving where, you know, I mean, we, as people, we like to compete, right. Um, sports was always a way for us to compete in the past. You know, the way I see sports is just, you know, a combination of, physical acuities and mental acuities, you know, uh, when you compete. But now as we move, as we evolve into more of a digital world, it seems natural that we're going to be competing in the digital world. And esports and gaming is how you compete in the digital world, right? So physical acuities become less important, um, mental acuities uh, become more important. So to me, it was obvious that that gaming and esports is gonna continue to rise and rise and rise and, you know, eventually become bigger than, bigger than any sport. Um, so, uh, and considering my interest, uh, you know, in gaming, considering my experience in poker and considering not just my experience as a, as a poker player, but also as a poker ambassador, right? When, when I was an ambassador for PokerStars, um, uh, all that experience um, got me to, th and Luca, basically, we, we started thinking, okay, how can we take that experience and how can we apply it to, to, to gaming and, and see uh, what value we can bring there and, and what makes sense to build? Um, so that was kind of the, the very, the very, very beginning of, of how we got uh, into into it. And that's and that's, you know, that's when we decided to uh, form Clash. Um, in the beginning, it was just a simple uh, esports team. We put together a Hearthstone team. Uh, we traveled all over the world with them. Um, you know, we traveled all throughout Europe. We tra We even traveled to Austin to some events. Basically, we used this opportunity to mainly um, learn about the industry, learn about what you know, what works and what doesn't, um, and you know, just network and meet people, and um, and then figure out, um, you know, what uh, what is the best approach that we can take uh, to this industry. So yeah, and 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 well, I, I want to spend a good chunk of time on this, but also just uh, kind of catch me up from this. To this point so then you you have some let's just scroll through memory lane here because you did have a couple decent results in your in your day of of grinding so you, you know you had a couple scores there early right like kept you mm -hmm. decent, decent scores and then all of a sudden you shoot up here take down blagio's been good to you it looks like you spent a lot of time yeah. at Blagio, and, and that's a yeah steady. i'd imagine that's where you stay when you go to vegas right yeah i love yeah. blagio i mean that's yeah. that's where i st spent most of my time and you know at the time i also played a lot of online poker um I remember I played a lot, you know, back in those days, I played, you know, basically party poker, poker stars, um, ultimate bet, uh, full tilt. I mean, all, you know, all the, all the, all the old school uh, sites. Um, and I, re I remember, I remember that summer where you see the Bellagio cup, where I won a hundred, where, where, where I won first place, literally like, uh, I think a few months before that I won, uh, the, the, the full tilt version of the, you know, the Sunday million. Um, yep. so that's kind oh, of from, that was my first experience show. no it wasn't from the uh no it, I, I was home but then but that's kind of what 
took me off. Like I won that for like 120,000. Then I won the Bellagio Cup. And then, you know, a few months later, I win the um, I win the Doyle Brunson Classic for two and a half million. So that yeah. just kind of like catapulted me into, you know, uh, into into a whole new, um, you know, stage. Yeah. So that was uh, so did they change the name? Because this like, again, you did three K one. You got fifth. Your buddy had half. You then roll it into this 15K in December and you get 35th. So you cash and the ground. He wins that. And then you go to, uh, you know, a couple years later here and they call it, so they change the name. This is the same tournament. They make it the Doyle Brunson. Is that what it is? Or is it a separate event? I think it's a separate event. Cause I think the other, oh, the, or, yeah. or is it? Oh yeah, you're right. Actually it is. You're right. I didn't realize okay. that. Yeah. Yeah. They well, must change the name. This is what we're here. This is what we're here to do on the, on the podcast. We're here to yeah. learn and grow and your own tournament that you won. So let's, let's revisit this. So, so at this point, you've got some confidence. You can say you've had some success online, been playing a lot of poker. Like, were you at this point, did you feel you could win? Were you coming in there and you felt like I can win this tournament? Or were you still sort of yeah. like, you, know, you knew you could play some poker and you were like, wow, this is uh, this is going to be a big one. And you were ready for it. Yeah, at the time, I, I, I thought I could win. I, I really I felt my 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 game was really, really um, improving at the time. I was just 100 percent focused on it. You know, um, I remember I spent a lot of time with uh, with with Nick Shulman. I mean, he's he's one of my closest friends, and uh, we spent a lot of time just chatting about the game and you know discussing strategies. And I, I really really felt comfortable with with my game at the time. So I just felt like if if you know if things if things fall right, I, I have all the all the chances to uh, to win. So and, and and how at that time at twenty two thousand seven, there's no raise your edge. There's no upswing. There's no yeah. uh, courses, you know, the, the the DTO trainers and stuff. What were you doing to work on your game? And why do you believe that you were a favorite? How did you, how are you able to win a 664 person, 15 K major, the largest world poker tour? It still might be to this day. Is that the largest uh, event that prize might be, probably, probably. it might be too. And if you, as you can see, look at the, look at the prize jumps. Like they don't do this anymore. I mean, look, first is double second and second is double third. Like it's yeah. crazy the the pride jumps here, pretty, um, pretty and wild. no one and no one did deals on final tables back then. Also, so that was that wasn't a thing either. So it was just nuts. Where, um, but the way have, like, did you have a hundred percent of yourself, or were you staked or backed, or did you have pieces swaps? Like what? No, were you I, I had yeah, I, I had I had a little over fifty percent of myself uh, in this event, maybe fifty five or sixty percent. I don't remember exactly. Nice. Um, uh, but it, uh, the the way to answer your question, the way I trained at the time, I would say what were uh, yeah there were literally there was no such thing as trainers you know any kind of software there, there was just no such thing so everyone kind of you know just just did what they thought was right a lot of which was mostly like talking to their friends um, so for me what was what was most valuable again is like talking to you know discussing strategies with my friends. And also observing good players play. So at the time, I did a lot of just watching, even online or or you know uh, or, or televised final tables where they showed the whole cards. And I and I really paid a lot of attention. I tried to get into the minds of the you know of the great players of the day and try to understand why do they do what they do. And um, and I tried you know and I experimented a lot. Um, I wanted to see can I implement that into my game. Um, you know, certain things work, certain things didn't, but, but that's what I found very, very useful for me back then when there was no, you know, kind of game theory oriented approach. I think back then the game was, you know, very much psychological. Um, it was very much, uh, in, in the sense of, uh, um, you know, trying to figure out what your opponent is trying to do and just, you know, just trick them into, into doing what you want. Um, uh, I, th I think back then it was, it was, um, um, I don't know. I, I found that was kind of the best strategy of the day for me. Yeah, no, it's interesting. What do you think now? Like, cause I, so when's the last time you played you, I think you hopped in 2018 or you, you played the world series main and you know, you're not really, you don't have time per se, right? It's just that you're busy business tournaments take multiple days. You, you know, I obviously love poker and, and, and we know that, but what do you feel like, say you go play the main event now, I'd, I'd imagine you're not keeping up with studying so much, right? It's just not, cause you're not putting a lot of time into poker, but how do you feel you would compete in like the the same tournament? You know, say like a 10K, the one in, in you know, the Bellagio WPT or the main event WSOP. Like, do you re you realize everyone's, there's so many good players, there's so much information sure. now. How do you feel like your edge at your peak, like how big a favor do you think you would be maybe in a field then? And where do you think you stack now? Like how and how that works? Because is it, is, kind of, is it kind of like, does it lose some interest to you knowing that like so, so many people are so good 
in poker at the moment and you just haven't been working your game or are you just like whatever i'll come play and i think i can you know you'll, you'll you know how to you know it's like a bike in a way like because you know how to play you know sizing you know bluff you yeah know so like how, how does that men- mentally feel for you when you approach like oh i might go play some poker I think well to, to to give you an idea of where I am with poker today. Um, I mean, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm you know ninety ninety nine percent of my time is focused on Clash, but I I still do play a little bit of poker here in Ukraine. I'm actually still I'm actually an ambassador for uh, a local Ukrainian site called Poker Match. Um, so so I'm an ambassador for them. It's a it, you know it's it's fully focused on Ukraine, and you know so I do get to play a little bit of online poker with them, and you know if live poker does come back, I'll also get to play a little bit of live poker with them, but. Obviously, I'm not. I'm not studying. I don't. You know, I, I don't have the time for that. Um, so, uh, if I, you know, when I do play poker, uh, obviously, I, I realize, you know, I, I probably wouldn't be able to compete with like with the top level guys, you know, who are all you know, game theory oriented. Um, but I, I also feel like, like the place that I want poker to have in my life is I, I actually want to just be able to enjoy it recreationally. So I, you know, uh, ideally I would just, you know, come to the World Series and just play recreationally and play like the main event and play, you know, play all these events, but just, just have fun. Not necessarily taking, you know, seriously, like trying to grind and like trying to win and whatever, but just really just, just be able to um, enough, enough, uh, you know, enough funds to just play them for fun and enjoy myself. Um, I think, I think that would give me the most, uh, the most pleasure. So that, that's kind of, that's kind of how I see poker now and myself, you know, I've transitioned out of being a, mm, out of a professional prof- professional player, more uh, transitioning more into a recreational one. That's the dream, isn't it? We all like we play, yeah. but ultimately you want to be playing the you know the Tritons and the the hundred Ks, the millions as a businessman at some point, and then have yeah. that kind of like you know how to play and compete. You're not really keeping up with that much, but it's fun. And and then I think that's sort of uh, yeah, that's the goal, right? We're we're still exactly pretty young and, and it, it's moving that way. And we there's some opportunities. Obviously, you're very involved with Clash, so super exciting. Uh, project that again I do want to spend a, a good chunk of time on, but I want to just kind of run through memory lane. It's got to be fun looking at that 2.4 million. Tell me, yeah. tell me before you run the next, the next part of that. How how was it when you won that? When you actually went to the final table? I see Ryan Doubt, a couple names. You know the legend, rest in peace, Dave Elliott there as well. Devilfish, like what was this like? Eric Lindgren. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of there's Daniel. Yeah, Daniel. Yeah. Daniel. Was, how, how was it, man? How was that feeling when you made it? Gus Hansen. Yeah, I mean a lot of big names. Huck Seed. To act JC Tran, I mean, or Jimmy Tran, not JC, but well, how was it when you actually hoisted that? Did, could you believe it? And what was your first thought? And is that when you got sponsored by Stars, or, or did that just kind of no, leave no, no, it? yeah, no, that- I wasn't, I wasn't sponsored by anyone back then. Um, it was, I remember it very, very clearly. I mean, I, uh, for most of the tournament, I was just kind of, you know, I, I was just maybe like average stacking, you know, all the way up. Um, and then uh, I remember. Uh, the day before the last day, or um, I remember um, I got pretty lucky in one hand that catapulted me to to a uh, pretty significant chip lead, and then I just kind of start, st- started to like run over the the final two tables, um, and I finished the day, and I remember I went to the final table um, as chip leader, so that was that was like a whirlwind of emotions and i you know i it was really exciting obviously i mean i had 24 hours until until the final table the next day um so my my family and like friends flew out out of new york and you know flew flew to you know to make sure to make the final table i think it was maybe it was the day after the next day so maybe there was a two day break but anyways everyone every, everyone kind of flew in and um and actually at the time uh, the final table, it finished so quick. I think it was like something like 57 hands. I literally, I knocked out every single player at the final table. And it was one of the fastest final tables ever. Like I just, you know, I ran really good. You know, I had a really, I was really, really um, uh, confident as well. And, you know, in my in my game and in, in my in the way my opponents played, I kind of really felt I knew where I was at with most of my opponents. Um, so yeah, things just really, um uh, you know came to, things really came together for me uh that tournament and then the next like two three weeks it was basically like you know the way i call it is like i was on cloud nine i mean i was just literally like flying in the clouds because <laughs> i was so happy you know obviously that that was a that was a life-changing money for me uh back then and um uh i remember we we got we, we took a private jet back to new york <laughs> all of us and uh with friends and, and family and um yeah it's just it was just just incredible. Uh, it's something I'll never forget. And obviously, it, it was a high that I was chasing for for the rest of my career. You know, uh, for better or for worse.
Yeah. And, and tell me a bit about that. So you, you get that, you hit the score, you know, like what, what was, did you take a break a bit after that? Did you, can, did you play right away? Were you playing online or did you just kind of like, did at that moment when the, you, you know, it's a life changing score, were you thinking, how do I play bigger, better games? Were you, did you invest immediately? What was sort of your mindset after you had this uh, uptick financially like this, this significant <clears throat> that early in what you were doing? I, you know, I actually remember after, after, you know, the initial shock of the win, you know, wore off, um, I was actually kind of worried and, uh, about losing it all. Cause I, in the sense that I knew a lot of, uh, you know, big name poker players who've won, uh, you know, similar amount, you know, similar sizes of, uh, of money as I did, but then they would go on and like lose it by, by playing big or whatever, um, you know, uh, um, because it just seems like, the money seems to come really easy when you win something like that. Um, and then when you lose it, you, you just feel like, Oh, you'll just win. You'll just win another one, but it's actually really, really difficult to win another one. Um, right. So I was, I was really, really scared of that. And I, you know, I tried to be cautious cause I knew uh, internally, I was always, um, um, uh, I always took high risks. Like, I don't know. I, I, I it's in my blood to like, just <laughs> to take, paper, take bigger, bigger, percent of myself uh, than I than I should be, and um, I really wanted to temper that down a little bit. Um, so uh, I remember I, I I do remember I played in a cash game soon thereafter, a big one in in Bobby's room, and I think I think it was something like maybe three six hundred no limit uh, with like with like an ante, and I remember I lost like fifty grand, and I was like holy shit. I was like, <laughs> I just lost 50,000. You know, it's like, this could go really quick. <laughs> this, you know, the, whatever, there's like one, one point, you know, two, three million that I got if I, you know, if I keep losing these 50. So that, that kind of knocked me back. Um, and you know, made me really, uh, think and maybe really careful. Uh, so, you know, at the time I, you know, I bought an, I bought an apartment for my grandparents, um, in New York. So I, you know, a, a good chunk of my money went there. Um, and then the rest, uh, I just kind of took it easy and, you know, I decided, you know, I want to continue traveling to all the big festivals and I want to continue playing. Um, I played a lot of cash games and tournaments. I, you know, I, I started playing mixed games at the time. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't pretty, particularly interested in being signed by any, any site back then. Uh, that wasn't really a thing, uh, for me. Um, so, and that didn't come up for at least another couple of years. I mean, when I, re the time that I started thinking about, um, uh, being signed by a poker site was, it was actually, I think it was around 2010 when, cause I remember in 2009, I had a really deep run in the, in the main event, the world series. Um, I was chip leader with 50 people left and, um, like it was, it was, it was a year that Phil Ivy made the final table. Um, and I knew Phil at the time. I knew Daniel pretty well at the time. And I remember Daniel, uh, approached me at some point and said that, uh, you'd be a good fit. You, you, you know, you might be a good fit for poker stars. Why don't you try, why don't you try out to be their ambassador? And I was like, well, what, what do I need to do? Like, I mean, that'd be pretty cool. I don't know. I don't know how that works or how that looks. But what do I need to do? And, um, and he said, you just, you just need to win something else big. You just one more, just one more time. Just, just, just for them to remember you and to, and to take notice. And that's when I remember that's when the Bahamas festival was, uh, coming up in, uh, uh, you know, January of 2011. And that's when the first 100K Super High Roller was announced. That was, you know, by far the biggest, you know, event at the time. I think it was the first 100K, um, and I decided to to play that. And <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and I and I, you know, I played that, and I ended up winning it. And the the the, the funny thing is, that not only did I win it, but I won it. I I beat Daniel heads up in it. <laughs> so 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 that was like that kind of put it. That was probably like the best you know, result was like a, like a movie style ending that, that I could hope for. And, you know, uh, that's obviously when I, uh, started talking with poker stars and, and I signed with them, uh, shortly thereafter. Yeah, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty sweet. I mean, for all, and then your buddy Nick's there too. You're there, yeah, the yeah. Bottom, you know, it's a, it's a seven figure score again, uh, and, and you, and you get it done. So that, and that was, um, you had a, and then also a second, so a pretty good week there. And then you, that was, that was roughly when you got the dialogue going, when did you officially sign and become part of poker stars? Yeah. So that was, uh, I think, uh, it, it must've been like, um, it must've been like March, uh, either February or March of, uh, of 2011. And then it was literally like two months before black Friday. <laughs> and the, the I got really lucky in that sense because I had a ton of money on full tilt 
<laughs> and you know, obviously they asked me to close my account. So I literally, I just withdrew everything. And I spent like, I spent all my points. I got a bunch of luggage and I just withdrew my money from full tilt, full tilt and moved it over to PokerStars. <laughs> so in that sense, I was kind of lucky. Um, uh, you know, you're running, good, uh, I mean, man. You're, running, you're running good. I hope you put this, this Midas touch on class. Yeah. It looks like it's going well yeah. and you're diving, diving in. Uh, so you, you get the deal with, with poker stars, you get your money off full tilt. That whole thing kind of went down around then. And then at that point, you know, you're, 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 you're it looks like, again, I don't, we'll just kind of scroll through quickly, but you have some big scores. You get third in the 5k EPT, another big score. You know, you're, you're traveling, you're hitting a lot of stops. When did you slow down? You get second. Wow. So you have a third and a second, the EPT. So that yeah. was your triple crown. Yeah. So you don't have a triple yeah. crown, but you've yeah. third. I was second. so I was really really close. Yeah, yeah. I was like I was wow. like this is gonna happen because I was like second, third, second. I was like, all right, next one's first. So that wow. was really really close. Man, big. And I, I was and I was chip leader here too. Like I, you know, I I, I kind of screwed up. I could have had it. Like the event in Barcelona, um, I I played. Uh, I was so jet lagged it, to the point where, um, I like for five days I slept for two hours every night. And I was so tired by by the final table. I that I literally asked them to bring a bucket of ice with a towel that I had to put on my neck because I couldn't focus. I just kept, I just you know, I, I was so tired. I just couldn't sleep. It was awful. So I just couldn't focus. It was, you know, um, all I had was adrenaline. But even after five or six days of adrenaline, that that alone can't keep you going. So, um, wow. You know. And 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 what what was your superpower as a player? What what makes you so tough? Because you know, listen, we we overlapped. I played uh, during my like kind of peak playing times were similar, right? We were playing uh, during those years, like up until when you sort of stopped and I, and I was playing a lot as well uh, in those those times. And on, on the circuit, like, what do you think when you sat down, how do you believe you were perceived? What, what How do you, people describe you as a poker player? Uh, well, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think everyone kind of described me differently. I mean, I think my superpower was always getting into people's heads in the sense, you know, like the way I saw my job was, you know, in the first hour at the table, I, you know, um, what I noticed a lot of people when they're out of the hand, they're just like on their phones or they're, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of focusing on something else. But I, I really tried, I, that's actually when I did most of my work. I, I was really the kind of, I zeroed in on my opponents. I, I looked at, you know, I observed hands that t went down because you can actually pick up a lot of the information that goes down when you're outside of the hand. And uh, especially if the hand goes to showdown, um, that that gave me a lot of knowledge as to how my opponents uh, perceive the game, you know, um, and approximately uh, at what level they play. And, and that, gave, that gave me a lot of room to, um, to then take advantage of that um, in my own way. So I, I really took the approach of, uh, adapting towards my opponents. Uh, that, that, I think that was kind of my, my superpower uh, at the time. Right. Very, very, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say, I just remember you definitely were a guy I didn't like to see. I knew you just, you come across, you know, very, yeah, very perceptive, very sharp. You're not going to give anything away. I would imagine you don't really tilt or at least, I mean, I would imagine, I don't <laughs> think I remember having you pegged as someone that would just go on tilt. Uh, and how, how do you, how do you kind of, did you meditate? Uh, do you have exercises? What what was kind of your your way of preparing for events and and even online? Like how do you how do you approach your your days and Sundays and how many tables did you play online? Give me sort of your your overall sure. uh, strategy and, and and plan from that perspective. Well, <laughs> tilting I certainly tilted, but maybe not maybe not visibly. Maybe I did I did it in pri more in private, but for sure I tilted. Um, uh, but I, you know I did I did try to work on that a lot. I you know I I fixed my diet. I started working out. I you know I started meditating. Um, you know, I did all these things and, you know, it was definitely very helpful. Um, in terms of my, um, you know, in regards to your question about like how many tables I played online at the time, I never, I was never the type to play like 20 tables at the same time. Like, like I remember Elkie did, you know, back in the day at most I, pl I played maybe like eight, nine, 10. That was probably like the most I played. Um, because for me, when it got to more tables than that, I felt like I really couldn't apply my actual skill, which was adapting towards my opponents. The game became too automatic at, then, uh, at that point. Um, and uh, I never used any, any tools online. Um, so for me, I also tried to kind of uh, make notes and you know, see who's doing what, even, even when playing online, uh, and then take advantage of that. Um, so obviously, playing lots of tables no, doesn't allow you to do that. So I prefer to just play less tables, but just like, uh, but really, really focus in. 
And, and, and now that you've gotten into gaming with Clash and, and doing that, do you think, would that have been something that just was a little before your time uh, with, with like streaming? Would that have been something you think you would have seen the gaming with, with esports, but poker with Twitch, for example, is that something you would have liked to have done? Do, do you think if say five years, 10 years, everything was moved up, it was, would you have been a, would you have streamed? Does that fit your personality to be, be a gamer? Um, I don't think so. I think because I'm I'm kind of I'm more introverted. I'd say uh, so. I don't know if I don't know if I could do um, if I could do streaming like full time. I think um, I just I, I just think it would like wear me out a lot. It would probably take a lot of my energy. Um, but uh, but I do enjoy like watching streams very much. Like one of my favorite pastimes is watching either poker streams or or just e you know e like different watching people play different games. Um, like I prefer, I prefer that even over watching like movies, uh, uh, oftentimes. So, so I do like, I'm, I'm more a watcher than, than, uh, than I, than I think, um, a streamer. Very, 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 very interesting. It's right. It is, it is personality driven. Uh, you know, I think it just depends, um, you know, on what your preference is and, 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 and exactly as you said that. It's uh, it's fun. It's fun to watch, but if it's not for you, you know, it's, it's got you got to want to you got to want to do it. It's kind of it's different to talk for like ten hours, twelve hours at a time, and also it, it takes a lot of focus too, right? Like, because if you're if yeah, you, like you, I don't know what you would attribute to because you haven't done it, but it does take up tables. Like, if you're playing four tables and you're streaming, it's really probably like six or eight total, right? Like, it's just uh, it's a lot to kind of keep track of. Um, and, and, and speak and speak and speak with with the community. Like it's very difficult to entertain the community while while focusing on the game. I think that's that's kind of tough. For, for sure. And 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 just looking, let's round out before the poker kind of stopped really playing. You did. It looks like you dove in for the main event. Cash in 2018, 2017 played the high roller. Uh, got deep and and cashed in that one as well. What was it? Was it was this just kind of like coming back in? Uh, for a, for a splash, or had you started playing a bit online and doing some work, and and what made you come and play these two these couple events in eighteen? Yeah, th this was already kind of me transitioning out of poker. So this this was just you know my, my my the final events. I was you know I started traveling less and less for poker. You know more and more focusing you know on clash and traveling for that. Um, so uh, I'd say that was just kind of like uh, me closing my my professional uh, career uh, in poker. Um, okay. So, and, and then what, is there any plans coming up? COVID happened. Uh, it's been yeah. kind of, well, what is there, a, is there an event on the horizon world series, something in Europe? Is there anything you go to in the next, next year or so, depending when stuff opens up? Well, like I said, I, I, I'm in Kiev, Ukraine now, uh, and I'm ambassador, I'm ambassador for, for a company called poker match. So they run events all the time, you know, so I know they're looking forward to to starting live events in Ukraine as well. So I'm, you know, perhaps I'll play something like that. And obviously, if I'm in the U.S., I would love to play the World Series. You know, be back at the Bellagio or something. And you know, if, if I have a chance, if I have some time, that's something I would definitely want to do. So, so certainly, like the World Series holds a special place in my heart, and I would love to 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 come back and um, play. Uh, not just hold them, but also like mixed games. I you know I miss those. Uh, I was a big big fan of mixed games, uh, always. Um, so uh, yeah, I do. I do hope I I find time for that. And and what other hobbies? Uh, since you're not playing a lot of poker, what is other hobbies when you're not working right now? Do you like any other type of games or things? What what are you doing in the in the spare time? If there's um, I don't really play any of the games. I do, like I said, I do like to watch uh, games. So I'm a big fan of uh, StarCraft II. Um, I like uh, PUBG. Um, but but I'm more uh, of an observer. I'm not. I don't actually uh, play those games. Um, so my pastime is, uh, you know, probably like just traveling when I can. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, but m mostly, honestly, it's just a, a lot of work, a lot of um, a lot of focus on work. And um, I actually kind of like it that way. Uh, I've, I, you know, I. Uh, I played poker professionally for what was it like 14 years, 14, 15 years, and. I didn't want to, when I started thinking about myself, uh, when I'll be like 50, you know, and, or like 40, 50, 60, and, and I, I didn't want to be a professional poker player uh, uh, my whole life. Um, I, I, I always kind of, I, I wanted to have this feel, I, I wanted to actually build something. I wanted to build, uh, build a business, build something that, that I could kind of like be proud of and, you know, and retain poker as a, uh, uh, recreationally is more of an entertainment um 
Uh, so yeah. I, um, I can relate on that too. It's, it's sort of like playing in good private games, even and stuff. It's like, it's cool. It's good. It's nice to try to make a bit of money, but what's your, you know, if you, whether it's Twitch or a business or, you know, doing something that has a foundation that you're building on is very important, right? Cause it's like you said, it's all of a sudden you're 50 or 40 or, and you have a family. Yeah. It's like, all right. Well, what if, what if your home game doesn't, isn't working out? What if, uh, you know, you, you want to have something that you're working and building equity towards and, and, and also learning some skills and attributes along the way. Uh, I, I agree completely. What, what would you say you've, you've taken into this business that you, into Clash, that you have uh, really, what skill set did you get from poker and things that you think really helped with, with this? And what have you learned so far? Um, the, the skill set, I guess, is uh, somewhat maybe like dealing with people. Um, and um, um, honestly, a lot of it was just kind of building from the ground up anyways. Um, but I, I think maybe just dealing with people people was 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 the biggest uh, was the biggest biggest thing that I, that I could say. Um, but also, um, uh, uh, I, I guess uh, I guess the other thing is, um, just the the risk taking because uh, because clash is a, is a is a really large idea it's a it's a long term idea it's something that Luca and I knew going in would be you know a 10 15 year project um, potentially a really big one but it will take a long long time there's no way to to build it quick so it required us to invest a lot of our personal funds into it uh, and then you know go through runs rounds of fundraising and um, you know and I've always read that those things are you know th those you know Initial aspects are are very risky. There, um, there's no guarantees. A lot of them fail. Um, but I really wanted to. Um, I really wanted to do it. I wanted to prove myself. I, um, I, I, con I consider myself really, really lucky in having found a partner such as Luca. Um, I think he brings to the table very different qualities than I do. Uh, and without him, this literally this could not work. So um, he is. Uh, he's. You know. Um, it's 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 hard to overstate uh, the value that he brings to the business. So I'm, I feel really really lucky that I have a uh, a close uh, friendship and partnership with with him. Um, so was that was that a difficult was that was that a really tough and rolling conversation or were you just like you know what like you said you had known Elky you saw esports the power of it the excitement the passion it, it fits a lot of your interests when you, when this idea started getting talked about because it's a bit intimidating right like I've been on some projects and things whether it's like I'm investing and just sort of letting watching the process or even building some stuff of my own. It's not easy. There's so many moving parts. You got, you know, it's hard to balance uh, the budget, right? Figure it out, how many people you need, how to spend yeah. it. You got to raise money, you know, which obviously I came on, you know, put, I contributed and, and I'm a part of the team now too. But it, how, how was that? Like, how did you guys, how were you able to sort of scope that out? And, 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 and was that like an easy decision for you? And like, all right, I'm just going to stop playing poker and do this. Or did you have to really take some time and weigh it all out or was it just did you just know this is what you wanted to do it was it was a transitional thing right like it's not like we knew from day one exactly how we wanted to approach this right like a date from from day one we knew we were going to risk our own money um just to kind of uh, build out the concept and and build um and you know build out uh build out the brand um and then eventually we evolved towards towards an idea that we now feel very very comfortable you know uh, confident in um so uh it, it was a step-by-step -step process honestly it, it it you know we just we just learned things one by one and, and i think the thing that worked really well was uh uh brainstorming with luca you know from the very beginning like we really kind of hit it off and um we had a lot of similar ideas about where where the future is and where the future is going um and uh you know we knew we wanted to be involved in the industry um and i felt like as long as we focus on building out the right team that's uh that's building this we it's not even that important to have the the real idea built in from the beginning because i think the team um is more important than than the business idea because as long as you have the right team you'll you'll evolve and you'll figure out um exactly uh you know which way you want to focus your business um so so i'd say in, in that you know in those core um approaches me and luca were are really aligned um so yeah that, that's that's yeah very cool and 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 how hands-on are you now how much are you, and, and what role do you have specifically within clash like what do you do on a day-to-day 
Um, so I tried my hand at many different things. Uh, I'm more involved with, uh, like today I'm more involved with like investor relations and, uh, more like high level strategies in terms of, uh, things like, um, uh, uh, how we want to expand, uh, you know, to different markets and, uh, and just, just high level things. Uh, Luca is much more involved operationally and more, more involved in sales. Luca is the CEO. Um, my title is I'm, I'm head of head of community. So that's kind of our focus. And, um, uh, so yeah, uh, I don't know if I, I don't like having titles, but, uh, right. Right. But Make, it makes sense. And, and, and with today's, today's day and age with NFTs and what's going on in esports and sports cards and digital cards, where does that fit in with esports? Are, are, are you are you seeing an idea here? Because you guys have, I mean, g- give a little bit of a, an idea on the scope of what you guys have. You have sure. a lot of how many players, how many teams, and do you think this NFT is that something that it could be a part of Clash's business model? What do you feel about it? I, I actually, I actually think it could be, but um, and quite naturally, actually. So I actually let me explain uh, what what Clash is for the audience because I don't think I don't think people know because we're not really we're not really an esports focused team. While we started out having you know a bunch of teams competing competing in esports, we um, we've since the very beginning we've um, uh, we've tried to be much more focused on the community. So so uh, the way we are structured is we try to build communities in many many different games, uh, and then we entertain those communities uh, by creating events for them, both online and live. And then we have the esports side and streamer and influencer side to entertain the communities. So think of it like um, uh, if you think about uh, poker stars, right? Or, or, you know, or any other, or, or most other, you know, or GG or whatever, any other uh, party poker or any other uh, poker platform, um, they're, focus- they're essentially event companies, right? They create events online. And the reason they have uh, professional poker players uh, as ambassadors, the reason they have, you know, streamers and influencers, they're just marketing tools to entertain and engage and entertain the community, um, and then to eventually drive them on the platform and to continue to entertain and engage them uh, online, right? Like, so those are their marketing tools. So we have a very similar approach where uh, we're essentially building communities in many different games. We have professional esport players, professional teams, and, you know, streamers and influencers, but they're not our, uh, you know, and goal, they're more uh, a tool for us to provide entertainment for our communities. That's that's a way for us to bring to bring value for our communities. Uh, we tell them, you know, we can you can play with one of our pros. You can get coaching from him. You can play in the same event with him. You can you know um, have a VIP experience in real life. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can come up with. Um, but we run lots and lots of events, and uh, our ultimate goal is to is to build our own platform uh, for for running these events, and then. Um, eventually find you know many other ways to uh to entertain entertain these gaming communities and in regards to your question about you know nfts and stuff um that that actually fits in into our model really well because from from the very beginning the way we saw ourselves evolving you know the, this clash platform is uh you know think about um you being able to play in in many different games um uh as long as we provide a really good experience to our community as long as they have fun um, we feel we can uh, transition into uh, uh, into actually monetizing this community by uh, in in similar ways as how games monetize games like Fortnite, right? Like they sell skins, they sell you know in-game badges, um, all, all sorts of things. I think we can do something very similar as long as we have a vibrant community, and that's where NFTs come into play. You know, we, where we can potentially sell things that are like really one of a kind, uh, you know, in-game. Um, and you know we and you know um, um, and uh, uh, how can I say it? Um, it's a, a similar concept. Is something that we always that we always had in mind for the future. So so the key is building um, value and and uh, and a vibrant community. Right. And is that uh, is that is that something with Clash that you could just go in a little more detail about what? I guess like the, all right. So Akari has Furia. That's his main project. Ben CB's got Raise Your Edge Gaming. Could you kind of break down? Cause esports to me, you know, I've gotten explained pretty well now, but between you and Akari and kind of Ben kind of understanding the different differences, but could you maybe just take those, for example, are those competitors? Are those, 
because uh, it's a bit confusing, you know, esports. It's like yeah. saying soccer, like in the world, right? There's the MLS, then there's the UEFA, then certain clubs can play against each other, and there's different teams, different like. So there's a lot going on. Esports is a pretty big, you know, multi, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars or trillion. I don't know. It's just massive, right? There's a lot of different things, yeah. a lot of different leagues. Give me the differences. Just take those because I think a lot of people here can relate. No, no of Ben or no of uh, Kari. They know of you. Sure. And sort of explain like, do you, do your teams match up in any or all? How how does it work? Explain the esports sort of uh, and use those two two examples of how how that works. Like those now, other teams. Um, from what I, I mean, from the little that I know about the, their approach, I think they have the more um, common approach of just build, building out, you know, trying to build out teams that compete on high levels and then, you know, find sponsorships uh, for those teams. And that's kind of that's kind of their business model. Um, so in the sense, uh, do we compete on esports? Yeah, we do. But but where's their goal is the actual competition and building out, um, you know, the best team possible um that's not our goal right like that's more of a of a tool for us to engage and entertain our community so i think our goal is different but we do compete in the esports space i think we're i think clash is more broad we're more focused on um on gaming as a whole rather than because esports is just the competitive side of gaming right um so i, I think we're more we're we're more of a gaming organization with an esports uh aspect um so that's the way I would characterize it. So I, I would say, in some in some sense, we we compete with them, um, but in some sense, we can also work together because the events that we organize, like we've um, we've partnered with uh, with big teams before uh, that we've invited to our events. You know, teams like Team Liquid, uh, SK, um, Cloud Nine, like all these teams we've worked with, and um, so so we see ourselves more. As, we see these teams more as someone we can work with rather than necessarily competitors. Makes makes a lot of sense. And what is the what what do you think is the biggest upside for esports? And and what you know, the, there's talks about and in, in years you'll you won't say oh you know you're on the Dallas Cowboys. You'll be like the owner of sports teams. And that you see that in the future on television, NBC, ABC, major networks that it's going to be esports. They're going to be showing competitions. Do you think that'll happen? Do you think the that like major contract deals for television? Or at some point, will it not even be television just because like you can watch, you know, via Twitch or other platforms? Like what is what is the big picture? What happens where there's an inflection point, five, 10 years, esports? Does it take over the NFL NBA? Does it get bigger? And how does it compare? Yeah, yeah I think I think it's already um, becoming bigger, you know, becoming bigger. I mean, in terms of just some general statistics, there's uh, already five over 500 million people uh, in the world that consider themselves fans of esports. Um, and, um, uh, and it's growing and, and it's, you know, it's, it's growing really, really fast. Um, but what's, what's, uh, what's really interesting is that when we actually looked into sports, into normal sports, we saw that statistically the average age of a sports fan is actually continuing to rise across all sports. So what does that say? Um, in essence, that says that young people are watching less and less normal sports. And I think that's because they're focused more, mainly on esports uh, and gaming. Um, so what the shift that we've kind of noticed over the last couple of years is a lot of sport teams, a lot of big sport clubs are are trying to enter esports. They don't know anything about it. They, they you know they don't know how to enter it, but they're trying to do something you know with it. And that's why you see, for example, all the NBA teams uh, across the U.S. They all started uh, you know. Uh, ver esport versions of their, you know, of of their teams, you know, competing in NBA 2K, um, and and uh, now you're seeing the same thing happening with lots of soccer clubs in, in in Europe, and that's that's where we kind of came in and we made deals with uh, um, with AC Milan, with Inter Milan before that, um, and with Villarreal in uh, in Spain. We basically see this transition where sport teams are are really trying to. Um, uh, uh, attract the young audience and they do that and, and they want to enter esports somehow and they look for us to expertise. It's super interesting. I did not realize that, you know, and I'm pretty, I consider myself mm. a loop within this sort of industry in general, like a little bit, like I'm, you know, I'm staying, staying alert to what's going on, but I didn't know that. So you're telling me the NBA, all the 32 teams, they all have an NBA 2K like team and they're competing. It's, if, it, if it's not 32, it's, I, I think, I think last number I remember was like 25 or 26. So it's like almost all of them. So, like wow. for example, like one of the teams, one of the teams we work with is is, uh, is Milwaukee Bucks, right? And they have Bucks Gaming. 
Um, so we, we, we did an NBA 2K event with them um, uh, in partnership with them. Um, and we're trying to, to, to help uh, bring NBA 2K to Europe, for example. But yeah, all of them, all of them have, uh, have all these sections. And they're, uh, it makes sense. Like FIFA, I know uh, the Castro is super big in that. And so like that, I mean, it makes perfect sense. Like how, what's a better yeah. way to bridge to have like the, you know, and then you could have some of the players you know, hop in and play a game yeah. and just do on two tournaments with one player, one, you know, one, one real player, one, whatever. Like there's just a lot of exactly. crossover. I think that's, that's kind of the, the NFT space, right? Which is what I'm I, basically one of my very sharp friends said this to me and it, it made a lot of sense that, you know, basically you're making programmable assets. That that's sort of what, what NFT, that'd be the most, like the way I would, that I thought it was explained the best, right? You could find mm. a way to an NFT where you could then do something that engages with people where it's an experience yeah. or, you know, you do a give like one of your players, you know, who's, who's the top, one of the top guys that clash, like in the, in the you know, most popular players you mentioned, I'm trying to get, let's get them on the podcast. First of all, like we got to yeah. get some gamers in here, man, but give me an example of like your, your biggest player, most popular, one of them, not, there's got well, lot. we, we actually have a few, but I mean, I would say maybe like the, the, the you know, the very top one is uh Raynor. He's the, um, uh, Ricardo Romiti. He's the number one, you know, arguably number one Starcraft two player in the world today. Um, What's his name? He's just a uh, Raynor. R. Well, that's his nickname. R E Y N O R. Um, All right, pull him up. So, for example, let's just take this guy Raynor, who is uh, hopefully this. He's he's one of the top players, correct? This guy right here. Yeah. Yeah. Here. Raynor. So, so like a guy like this, NFT seems like it would be perfect for him, right? Because he could make a card, he could make something, and then like you could you could tie it in with an experience, or you could make multiple cards and then you could have a you know collect all and you get a, you get to uh zoom call with him or uh you know play a game with him online right you can tie in sort of a, so, a an asset with like an experience and that to me is what's exa so cool. exactly yeah. so imagine imagine on our platform where you're playing all these events imagine you can get a jersey of rainer and you can you can have that as a very unique jersey that you play with and everyone else in the community sees you playing with that jersey right like that could be a valuable thing um so that's that's the direction that's exactly the direction that uh, that we're looking at and actually an example of that is uh i mean it's not really an nft but um in if you if you play fifa 21 um you can actually select we were one of the few teams uh that were granted a jersey in game so you can actually play fifa 21 and select the and play as clash and you can play you know uh with uh with clash jerseys um so it's not exactly nft but it's but it's cer it's certainly something that we've seen uh that was really really popular and um you know millions of people selecting that jersey and playing with it so uh, i think there's a place for nfts there as well uh, yeah it's uh it's, pr it's pretty 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 freaking cool i do want to make sure we leave uh time for some questions because there's a lot and and we've covered a lot but we'll uh yeah love to have how old is this guy jeez man he's like looks like he's <laughs> He's young. He, I think he's either 18 or 19. He's really young. Yeah. Well, lo love to, yeah. Love to have him, uh, have some gamers. I'm, I'm trying to branch out of, uh, uh, a, a uh, you know, the, the poker world. And, and, and I love it. I love, I love all this. I love daily fantasy. I love, I love esports. I think it's a, it's a really cool time. Look at all these questions. I don't even know how we're going to get to do wow. these. Let's try. I saw, I saw some I wanted to ask as well. So I'm going to, I'm going to double, sure double dip on that and we'll just let it be part of the giveaway here so let me click on this oh we've got another podcast tomorrow actually guys 2 p.m you're gonna not want to miss that but let's focus here and go through some of these uh oh ask them what is it going to take to get a poker flow show logo on the class jersey this is from ghost of Van Marshall, <laughs> the moderator. Let me ask speaking of sponsorship so what would it cost how does it work what are what are some of the deals and how does sponsorship uh what, what are some options to to do this because this is big now i know a lot of sponsorship you know t deals happening in esports and starting to get into real sports clubs and whatnot so how does that work there's, a, there's lots of different ways that's that we work with sponsors um it, it, uh, you know the, the very basic way is just you know put their logo on our jersey so when players compete the more eyes that there are on their players the more value that brings to our sponsors right so so we can you know um we can make deals that way um but there are also more creative ways where where we really kind of activate the sponsors brands and you know i think the way we can do that is is actually through event creation um so um to give you an example um we had an event with a company called abarth uh it's a it's a car manufacturer um what uh, they they basically create sport sport versions of fiat's uh so think of it like a like amg for mercedes 
that that would be a, a, for Fiat. Um, okay. So so what we did for them is we created we created a league for them, uh, a simulated racing league. Um, and inside in so inside one of the racing games, you know the whole the whole race was covered, you know, by by their logo. So we actually impl impl implanted their you know their logo inside the game. Um, so that was that was you know that was that's something that they appreciated much more. And obviously we did streaming around the game uh, around the around the event. Um, so that's 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 a way I think that that we can bring more value to to our sponsors. Um, and um, uh, I mean, there's uh, there's lots of different there's lots of different other examples that where where you can you know kind of activate uh, sponsors in uh, in better ways than just placing the logo. But there's many different right. options. Right? What is it? What does it take? What is it for Poker Flow Show? What do I, how much do I gotta throw? <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, you gotta talk to Luca about that because he's responsible for for uh, for sales. So he's the one talking to all the sponsors. So you you got you got to reach out to him. <laughs> right, fair enough. Well, or maybe he'll be on the pod as well. That would be great. Yeah. Uh, favorite city in the world? Give me one for in general and one for poker. Uh favorite city in the world? Probably Tokyo. Probably my for, my my. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, just I, I I love Tokyo. Uh, and for poker, um, it's gotta be. It's probably Barcelona. I mean, that's probably like just so fun. I mean, Barcelona or or honestly just Vegas. Uh, so many good memories related to Vegas, and I love Vegas. So M makes a lot of sense. All right, we got a question from my man Claudio here asking, which player did you like to face? Not necessarily because who was just fun. Who did you like to battle with? Whether it was a friend or you thought they were not so strong at poker, or just it was fun to play with, or you just seemed to run well against. Give me a couple guys that you just always like to see at the table. Don't have to specify. Um. Um. I mean, it was it was there were so many players right across the years. Um, in general, it was you know mostly like the the superstars of poker, like Daniel, Phil, you know Phil Ivy, Phil Helmuth, um, like the the guys that you kind of saw saw on TV a lot. Um, that was kind of excited because they, they remained uh, uh, as superstars for me from from when I was just coming up. So in that sense, it was really fun to to face them all the time. Yeah, very very. I, I mean, it is. It's all. It, it's just nice, right, to to battle with some of the the legends, like the guys that were yeah. maybe just before us, or you you saw growing up, and and now that you're you know partners, or they've they've invested as well. It's cool to have Phil and Phil and Daniel involved with Clash as well. Uh, what is there anything we can do? Can we do like a poker tournament or a stream or something? Can, I feel like we need to do uh, yeah something with like the four of us get Luca in there too, and then maybe like a two table sit and go something with some other streamers from Clash and some guests. Like we we got to do some poker event man we let's gotta, do we it gotta, let's let's get we to, we gotta we gotta figure this out so we would we would love to do that honestly we would love to do that we we even because uh, we, we have a clash house right like it's, it's the largest gaming house in in europe uh that we kind of um uh where you know our players stay we run lots of events and produce a lot of media there so we actually have a we actually have a, a poker table there and we actually did a poker stream one time for for fun with our players uh, with our esport players um and luca played in it so we would love to do something like that that um, that uh, that that would be I, I, especially especially because I see poker as so you know I, I in 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 a way I see poker as just another esport uh, in a sense um, just like chess is today seen um, as kind of you know as kind of an a, an esport um, these are mm, so the, we just yeah. see a lot of um, uh, a lot of connections there and and one of the interesting things when I was traveling uh, around esport events. You know, oftentimes uh, when we ask people what they think about poker, and they they all saw they all saw poker as just you know as as a, as like a, a cousin industry, as something very connected to esports. Absolutely, no, it's, I mean it's it is really close, and and I think everyone just kind of loves loves poker in general, and they maybe don't know how yeah. to play it so well, but they it's just kind of like a it's a fun game with the perfect mix of luck and skill. Now, I want to ask you about this deal before we kind of keep going. I just thought about this again because we were we were talking about it, and I get, you did a deal with uh, AC Milan. Now, is that correct? Yeah. So that that was this was like a first of a. We're really proud of that uh, that deal because it's a it's a first time it, we created a really really close partnership with ac milan where we actually created a new brand together uh called milan milan clash um and uh our fifa players and our brawl stars players um uh essentially play under under that brand and wear that jersey um and essentially using uh using the ac milan you know massive massive brand um uh and our know-how about gaming and esports uh 
they get they get to attract a younger audience and we get to to use their massive fan base and their brand and you know we, we created this new brand that we can now um sell to sponsors uh we can you know uh, um and create create different kinds of events around so i think i think this is one of the key ways that uh where we can bring value to some companies around the world like like specifically sport teams like uh, ac milan um, and, and is, is this is this though something that you so you have an exclusive essentially with them or could you do this with other clubs or within you know this is uh, you mentioned different is it different leagues there's one with spain you have one in in uh, Italy. So how does that? How are you? How does that deal work exactly? Well, we're ex we're exclusive with them in Italy, um, and obviously the teams that play for them can't play for any other any other um, any other uh, sport team. Uh, but we also have a, uh, a deal with Villarreal in uh, in Spain, where we have a separate group of Spanish uh, FIFA players that play under under their brand. Um, it's a slightly different deal. It's not uh, it's not as close as the one with AC Milan, but it's still one one where um where we appear on the on the Villarreal esports jersey um and we kind of handle their esports site for them very very and, and, and we're, we're exploring something very similar in other markets as well that's that's very cool all right let's but i just get when i get sidetracked i'm just gonna ask hop in but let's keep these questions again guys 111 dollar ticket available for a giveaway at the end of the stream uh we're gonna gonna give that away and right now we're just kind of going through Taking some questions. Uh, what was the time in poker we really thought, yes, I've made it? I think we already covered that, but was that that score? Was that the two point? Yeah, I would say yeah, the two thousand seven. Yeah, for sure. Uh, in in uh, the deal with Poker Stars, you made so in, in March of eleven, you you hit that one point five million score, beating the ground your heads up in the first one of the first hundred k's, if not the first. You know, televised. It's exciting. You get the deal. How was that? How did that compare to winning the two point five? Like when you were like, wow, I'm getting like paid. A salary to represent the biggest poker site at the time. Like, how how, how did that rank with everything? And then, and, and if you, I don't know if you can give, can you give not necessarily the dollar amount, but like, was it buy-ins? How how was that done back in that day? And and and, and uh, I know there's a lot of different deals that were made with stars along the way, or different different types of deals. How was yours sort of structured? If you don't, if you can share anything. Yeah, I mean, it was a mix. It was a mix of buy-ins, mix of cash, uh, mix of you know, uh, mix of some expenses being paid. Um, it wasn't a particularly you know large deal. I think at the time it was just a way for me to become um, to become closer to to their brand and 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 see what you know how I can evolve and uh, essentially create another. Uh, well, for me, it was just uh, how do I build my brand and create another revenue source in addition to poker. Um, so, you know, I kind of had to start somewhere and, uh, yeah. And, and I think that was, it was a really good relationship. I stayed with them for, for five years, uh, representing Ukraine. Um, that's when I actually started spending a lot of time here. Uh, and one of the reasons I, I remain here now. Very cool. Um, okay. Uh, what, so we, we, again, some of these questions, guys, we already covered, we've been chatting about what led you to esports. We did kind of go, we went through that. Uh, give me the type of tournaments you prefer to play. I mean, online now there's a lot of knockouts and stuff. But you're not playing a lot. What, what's your? Do you like the vanilla? Do you like rebuys? What's your? What's your perfect poker tournament? My perfect poker tournament, um, probably not rebuy. I actually like the free. I like freeze outs and like high buy in freeze outs where people like everyone's kind of taking it seriously and and if you're out, you're out. I I, I like those kind of uh, <laughs> old school events. I guess um, that's probably my favorite. Very nice. Uh, Favorite underrated poker hand? What's your what's your kind of like fun hand? Not aces, kings. What what's one you just love to look at? And it's fun to play. Um, my my favorite fun one to play. Maybe a hand like three five suited or something. You can make sneaky wheels and uh, beat up uh, ace x when when they flop and <laughs> when they flop an ace. I don't know hands like that. Th th those are those are like hands I remember from cash game days when you're when you're playing like three four five hundred blinds deep. So really really deep. That's uh yeah those those are those are definitely the more the more fun ones to play. Yeah. Uh, people asking again, we got Fabio Turbina asking about why ex professional poker poker player no longer play high value. I think you mean high buy in tournaments. So again, he's doing clash. That's what we're talking about. He's he's sort of uh you know in a way moved on or, or taking a break. Do you see yourself coming back? Could you see yourself like, like clash sells for you know two billion in three five years and. You know, you got whatever you cash out, and then it's like you know you love poker and it's sort of fun. You go to some cool stops. You flick in a buy-in. Is that? Is it, do you see yourself going full circle? Like you think you'll come back <laughs> and, and play again that's, in the tour? 
That's exactly right. That's exa I mean, that's exactly where I would I would love to to kind of end up in. You know, uh, creating a massive success out of Clash and then having enough time um, to actually go go back into poker and playing recreationally, <laughs> and you know, uh, and just having fun there, playing all sorts of buy-ins. That's yeah. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Maybe we'll hop back on. You know, yeah. have a you don't have kids, right? You you have a serious girlfriend, fiance. You're married. What's the what's the? It's single. I forgot to clear this up. You're not single. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's just the ladies. We might drop off some viewers. I had to do it later in the show. What, what's going on? What do we got? I'm married. I don't have kids now. Um, but not yet. Uh, but uh, I'm married now for for two years, and uh, I've been together with my wife for for six years. Nice. So we live in Ukraine. She has her own successful business that she's focused on. Um, yeah, and uh, happily, happily married. Very nice. That's that's uh, that's I, that's funny. You say happily married, you know, because you you must have a lot. Of, you know, we're at the age now where we've had a lot of friends. Most of our friends are married and stuff. And listen, it's like ace king to queens. A lot of marriages don't work, right? Queens to ace yeah, king, yeah, yeah, fifty percent. And you know, and then even then, there's the married, but maybe not happily. So I love how you threw that in. Yeah. I, I am also happily married, and uh, yeah, good. That's good to hear. And sorry to the the vultures That's out there. Any ladies? Any ladies? That are looking <laughs> Uh, successful businessman not on the table uh right now um we ask about this a lot of questions guys you're asking great questions and i've gotten a few from you uh we, we we talked about the feeling when you won the wpt i mean that's got to be uh i do want to just kind of go off of that you took a jet home you got your family how was your family in support about poker uh at the beginning you know like where, where they you went to nyu you're very had a good education i'm sure your parents were very yeah. you know must be smart as well and very very uh, studious and like, what was that like? Hey guys, I'm going to play poker for a living. How did that go? I always like to, this is my favorite question on, on, on the podcast. Yeah, I, I think, I think uh, this is probably one, one of the places I was, I, I've been really, really lucky in. Uh, in terms, I've had, I have really, really great parents and they've, they've been really, really supportive of, uh, of everything that I've done. I think it's probably because they respect me in, in terms of the choices that I make and they know that I want, you know, I won't do something stupid. Um, when I, when I first started playing poker, uh, my mom was maybe wasn't really sure. She wasn't against it, but she just wasn't, you know, she didn't really take it seriously, I would say. Uh, my dad was very supportive from the very beginning because my dad, you know, kind of gambled and played cards from, you know, from his childhood. So he was really into it. Um, uh, but then as soon as I, as soon as I actually started making money in it, um, my mom obviously also came on board and, and, and supported me. And um, so, you know, I, I consider myself very, very fortunate. Uh, and having and having that support because I, I think I think it would be really tough if I didn't. Yeah, no, it's nice to it's it really is nice to have that support, right? Because it's uh, it makes it all the it's just adds yeah. extra pressure and um, you know it, it, it's a whole different uh, whole different deal when you don't have support. So that that's awesome. Uh, what would you give yourself advice? What, what would you tell yourself, your twenty year old self? That's a good question. Um, my twenty year old self. Uh, that, um, uh, be more, well, be risky at 20, but start becoming less risk averse and really diversify, uh, really, really think about yourself when, where you're going to be in the future. Um, and make sure if, if you are fortunate enough to be in a position where you're, where you're making some money, make sure to, um, to, you know, plant some plant some seeds in others in other spaces in case uh, in case this uh, in case this this doesn't continue or doesn't work out. Really good advice. Um, okay, let's see. How would you define your career in poker? Interesting. Give it. You don't like titles, labels, but give me like give me your looking back. You don't ever play again. You have kids. Your kids ask you, "Hey, Dad, what were you doing from this second period of time?" You know, they see you were successful. What would you be like? Oh, this is yeah. How would you sum up your poker career up to this point i mean um lots of ups and downs i mean it certainly just wasn't like all good a lot you know lots of stressful periods as well lots of good periods lots of stressful periods um you know it was a, it was a big mix um but uh it kind of got me to where i am today and i'm very thankful for that uh, i'm very thankful for the kind of people like i said like in the beginning of the show it, uh, i'm very thankful for the kind of people that i get i got to meet um and um um, and for the opportunities that I had because of poker, like that's really, really cool. Uh, and I just love the game. So, uh, I do hope I'll have some more time to play it. Very, 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 very well said. What's your favorite sport? My favorite sport, um, probably, I don't watch much sports to be honest with you. Um, but it's, it's probably tennis. 
Uh, although I don't, I don't follow it that much, but I used to love playing tennis. Uh, what is the, what is the market size? Biggest difference in market size between esports and poker? Asked Chris Robinson. Great question because it's uh, definitely different scales. How, how would you, how would you? Sure. That? So the market size of, uh, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. So the market size of esports as of today, it's already, it's approaching a billion dollars um, market size. Uh, and it's growing, I think it's growing like 20% uh, year over year. So it's growing really fast. Um, but if you if you zoom out and you look at gaming as a whole, so I don't know if you know that, but gaming as a whole is actually a, a larger industry than the movie industry, than the music industry. Um, it's actually, I think it's uh, it's a hundred, uh, at this point, it's a $160 billion industry. It's, it's absolutely massive. Uh, and it's also growing, I think it's growing like 10% year over year. So uh, as I said, esports is the competitive side of um, of gaming, but it's also what drives a lot of the interest within gaming. So so because there are 500 million fans in esports um, and, there's, and there's obviously like, you know, two and a half billion people who game, um, uh, you know, esports drive their interest towards gaming. And, you know, I would say uh, that, that's how you get this, you know, this massive, massive industry. Makes, 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 uh, man, it's really crazy. And, and, oh, and also just to add, comparing it to poker, um, uh, I would say one of the coolest things about, about esports and gaming is that it's not, you know, it's not limited like poker, uh, in terms of sponsorships, because unfortunately, you know, um, poker is often, you know, branded together with, with gambling. And that's why it's so hard to find big sponsors in poker, right? Uh, that's why it's hard to attract big brands into poker. Um, that doesn't exist in esports. So I think in that sense, esports uh, has an advantage in that. You know, it attracts you know massive companies like you know, Nike, Mastercard, uh, you know Mercedes, BMW, companies that that are uh, a little bit more cautious when when it comes to poker. Right, and 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 do you think that uh, esports in like the U.S. Where does that compare towards like Europe? I mean, you're in Europe. You know, esports. Do you think? Give me like a breakdown and sort of the rankings of size, scale, and teams in, in the world. How does the U.S. compare to, to 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 like you know Italy or France and Germany? What are sort of the powerhouses in esports country wise? Yeah, I mean, in terms of teams, U.S. U.S. is probably is probably the you know it's growing really really fast. You know, some of the top definitely some of the top teams in the world are U.S. based, like Cloud Nine, Hundred Thieves, um, Phase Clan, um, and then in Europe. Uh, I think you have like teams like Team Liquid, SK Gaming. Um, it, it, certainly, US is bigger than Europe, um, but it, it, esports is just—it's growing everywhere. It's growing in Asia. Obviously, it's been huge for a long time. It's now starting to take off, and you know, in South America. Uh, funny enough, it's also starting to take off also in Middle East uh, because we're actually you know doing doing a few things uh, in Egypt, and you know, it's really—I I think the future is really bright there. Uh, as well for esports, it's just it's growing worldwide um, in India as well, and I think because a lot of a lot of esports is moving on to mobile phones as well. That's mm -hmm. that's actually where we focus on it a lot as well because it's just more accessible. Like not everyone can afford a computer, not everyone can afford a PlayStation or an Xbox, but most people have a smartphone, right? Like uh, most people around the world have that. So that's why mobile games are really coming up, and mobile esports uh, are really uh, really coming up as well. For sure. And, and what do you think about the crypto space with the BTC, Ethereum? Is that something with blockchain? And we kind of touched on the NFTs. Now, how does this apply and how, how do you see this kind of tying in with esports? And, and is it all sort of uh, just the future? Like, do you, do you have any feelings on crypto in particular? And, and how does it combine? Well, yeah, I don't know how other teams see it, but we certainly see it as something that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, to how we plan to use, you know, something like NFT or um, you know, something like selling skins, for example, within within our platform. Um, we we having having a cryptocurrency or either our own or or some other existing one is something that we definitely would want to implement in our platform because we could we see it as a, as the lifeblood of the whole system that connects all of our verticals. It, it will connect our competitive side our network, our streamers, our influencers, our event organization, and our community. And, you know, um, it's, it's, it's something that, uh, that we're definitely moving towards uh, and something that I think uh, um, we'll be developing over the next uh, one, two years. Yeah, uh, that is 
uh, man, we, we're very aligned on a lot of the thoughts, a lot of things that's going on. It, it is a fun, it's a fun sweat too, right? It's good. It's got action. You, do, do you find yourself watching and getting wrapped up in the results of your, of your teams? And, and like, do you know, the yeah. standings of all the leagues, how many different teams is in clash? How many different, different things do you have going at any given time? Well, it, go, it varies, right? Like sometimes we, 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 I, yeah, at some point we had like 15 teams at the same time. So it was like, it was massive. Uh, at this point today, I think we have, uh, six or seven teams. Um, uh, so, uh, I would say our main titles are, uh, Brawl Stars, um, Starcraft two and FIFA, uh, I would say are our main titles. That's where kind of we're strongest at where we compete at the, you know, at like the tier one level. Um, uh, so yeah, if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. And what do you think is maybe the most underrated the spot right now, like in terms of game that's just sort of on the rise? Like, is there one game, you know, everyone, people have heard of League of Legends and these different, you know, FIFA, but is there any game that's sort of like sneaky coming up that you guys, did you look at that? Do you look at like, Hey, this game's popular, yeah. maybe a team. And is that a big part of it? Cause the upside so big, just like crypto, for example, Bitcoin or Ethereum, you know, cool, it's safe, it's probably going to do well. Everyone knows it, but then there's like OMI or, you know, flow. And he's like up these kind of, different ones that just have these shots for like moon shots. Do, do you take, do you do, how do you break down your safe plays, your safe teams and where do you bring in new teams? How do you, how do you sort of uh, decide that? We do focus on that a lot actually, because, um, because we actually see the opportunity is in, is in, is in focusing in new games because we, while you never know which game is going to take off uh, and which will be popular or not, um, we, we do want to be there for, uh, for if, you know, if a new game takes off, we want to be organizing events in that game and potentially, you know, getting a competitive team around that game and uh, participating in it. I, mean, I, I think this is the way to um, to not um, uh, uh, to not be at risk of being involved in only you know in one of the in one or two games. Um, so we we want to be known as a place to 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 go um, to find your community in any existing or new upcoming game. Uh, so we do, you know, definitely, um, that's something that we did with uh, Brawl Stars, for example, when it was still in beta, you know, we launched a community, we launched uh, an Instagram around it and, um, and it grew to be massive. Like it's one of our, you know, it's one of our biggest successes of all time. And it's, um, we have the largest Instagram channel in the game, uh, aside from the actual, you know, uh, game publisher channel, like we have like 300, almost 300,000 followers on Instagram, you know, just for that game. Um, and you know, we run really, really big events, uh, you know, for it and, and we have one of the best teams in the world for it. So, and that's only because we kind of, you know, we got into it from, from the very beginning. So that's our approach. We launch, you know, uh, um, communities and social media, uh, channels in all these different games. And, you know, if they take off, you know, great. We, we keep investing into it. If it doesn't, you know, we just move on. Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 cool. It's good to see that you guys are you are doing. How many how many people are at the operation? Like how many you got you and Luca? How many how many are under not yeah. the player side? How much are on the the day to day uh, team of of your of your company with Clash? So to give you some basic statistics, we have uh, almost uh, we have like twenty five people full time. We have offices in uh, Sofia, Bulgaria. We have uh, in Italy and in Spain. Um, and our IT team is in uh, is in Ukraine here in Kiev. Um, then we also have around you know thirty or forty people working part time. Um, that's 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 just people who are making everything work. And that doesn't include you know uh, we have over a hundred um, you know professional players and uh, streamers and influencers who are under contract with us uh, who basically represent Clash uh, when they play, compete, or stream. So yeah. it's a big it's a big operation <laughs> at this point, and right. you know one of the re one of the reasons why um, why we are in the middle of a a fundraising as well um, of our first kind of uh, outside fundraising round. It's something that obviously we've never had experience uh, in the past, um, but you know something we're definitely learning uh, learning about now. And um, uh, you know we are more of a of a venture business um, that that'll re you know that'll require. Uh, basically because we always saw that our, you know, our success is going to come, uh, maybe five, six years after, after launch, not immediately. We didn't even focus on revenues, for example, until, until last year, uh, we focused much more on just brand building, community building, and really just developing and proving that our approach, um, has traction in the industry. Yeah, I, 
I got, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta ask because I just bet on people. I bet on you. You know, I, I remember your, I just, you know, whatever energy, just knowing each other. We've been friends, but not, you know, not, we don't, it wasn't like we're hanging out on tours and stuff. I knew who you were. I know you're successful. I know you're onto something, obviously to leave poker kind of at the top or winning and going to something bigger. And then obviously Helmuth and I are, we're, we're close. We're in a lot of business investments together. I know Daniel also good friend and, and we chat a lot. And so those are names I want to be involved with. I believe there's big potential in esports. I kind of just came in, you know, even to this day, I don't really know, like you've explained to me, but it's a lot. It's a lot to follow. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't even really know. Could you explain what's the exit? What like people invest in esports? Like what is the actual, like, give me a couple scenarios. Is it something that's sold? Is it dividends? Like and for those that would in this particular fundraising, the people that would come in, like, what are the ways that monetize? There's three verticals. Maybe can you talk a little bit about what the maybe like two year, five year, 10 year plan is, or what sure. is your, what is the plan? What is Eugene going to do? When are you going to get in those sure. million dollar Titans and unload <laughs> clash? Sure. So, so there, obviously we don't know exactly how it's going to happen in the future, but I can, I can, I can kind of lay out the way we see it today. Today we're, you know, the, the business side um, uh, of our company is uh, essentially we're, we're more of a B2B company for today, right? Like we, most of our revenues are coming from dealings with, uh, with sponsors. Um, uh, but as I said, we're we're reinvesting a lot of those uh, a lot of that funding into into our platform, which is already which already exists. It's still I would still say it's like an alpha version, but we're it's already like kind of growing fast, and we have lots we're running lots of events in, in a few games there, um, and we're obviously investing a lot into development uh, of it. So on the business side, we 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 do see ourselves starting to monetize that you know maybe a couple of years from now uh, once we feel comfortable. So in terms of an exit strategy. Um, you know the way I envision it, we either become you know such you know such a you know big platform for for all these different games, and uh, obviously just just a just a uh, a successful company that you know pays dividends. Um, I guess acquisition is another uh, another another possibility by some you know by some massive conglomerate uh, that may be interested in, in our brand and in our platform in the future. Um, but as I said, we're we're in this for the long term. I think most of our value. Um, uh, because our community is essentially like, you know, it's a lot of young kids and young adults who are with us now. As long as we do a good job entertaining them um, and bringing value to them, in five, 10 years, when they're going to grow up, uh, they're going to be kind of like lifelong fans of Clash. And that's where I think our value is uh, in, you know, in that kind of time scale. Uh, but, it, but it's also, you know, um, a value that, that could be uh, really, really big, uh, hopefully in the billions. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we're yeah. shooting really, really high, but but to build really to build something as as big as we hope, um, it it takes time. And and okay, and but you're, I mean, is it something too where you think that that, I mean, you don't think, I don't know the growth numbers, but it's got it the last five ten years. Uh, it, it's 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 just, I mean, it's growing very quickly. Like, do you think that there's do you think it's like what kind of curve do you think see it going growing in general esports the next few years do you think it's like just kind of it just seems like one of those things like almost like nft is brand new everyone's kind of hearing about it. no one really gets it esports like i don't feel like people really get and it's like a, just so much happening and so many different things yeah like it's sort of like gonna maybe some get trimmed off some's gonna work some some will consolidate uh it just seems like unclear the trajectory to me like how fast it can grow like you where do you sort of see the industry like going over the few years in terms of growth so so you're absolutely right it's an industry with a lot of moving parts and it's very difficult to predict you don't know which games are going to continue being big you don't know which new games are going to pop up uh there's lots of moving parts and uh you know then 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 there could be like revolutions within the industry right like for example maybe through vr or ar you know all, all these technologies that are coming up um these could further revolutionize uh esports uh and gaming um so it's very it makes it very difficult to predict where it's going to be in five ten years uh directly but 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 you're very but you can definitely see that it's, it's just going to in, as a whole, it's going to continue becoming bigger and bigger, and the pie is becoming bigger and bigger for everyone. So, um, you know, there's a lot of space for a lot of companies to succeed, um, and uh, you know, seeing lots and lots of competitors pop up is, is a good sign because I think a lot of a lot of people see, see uh, the same opportunity that that we do. Um, and the industry is so massive that uh, it's just going to continue growing. That there's going to be enough for everyone. I, I, okay, that, I mean, that's just what, that's what my gut says. Obviously you're bullish, but I just curious, you know, how the, how, how much it could, 
you know, the, 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 uh, the ceiling, it just seems kind of unlimited. I mean, you see scholarships, being yeah. given at universities and, and it just, you know, like now you mentioned NBA, they have like almost like if you will, youth teams or, you know, the, the, yeah. with the kids coming in and get them interested. So, uh, it, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Um, what was the big step? We got a question over here from soup poker soup asking what big step you took when you first started playing poker in your career. Did you have the funds already or how did you go about that? Yeah. How did you build your bankroll? Uh, no, I didn't have, I mean, I kind of build it from the ground up. I mean, I was playing, I remember I was playing like uh, $5 sit and goes on party poker, <laughs> like, you know, um, and I, I remember at some point I was making like 30, 40 bucks a day. That was kind of cool. Uh, that was like my first memory of, uh, of having some sort of stable income at the time when I was still kind of living, living with my, with my parents. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I mean, I kind of built it from the ground up and, and then I played, uh, small cash games and, uh, yeah, like I said, I built up a couple of thousand dollars and started playing bigger cash games and then, and then, and then tournaments. And then, and then eventually, um, I did transition into more mixed games when I had a big, like all the, all the big mixed games and. Yeah, that, that's a, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta ask if you thought right now you could come back into poker, you know, to build your bankroll, how much harder do you think? Give me a scale. If you just, if like take yourself and you plop your, how old were yeah. you in college? What, you're 21, you're 20 and you started like, yeah. Into it. How, how hard, like knowing what poker was then and knowing kind of now what you see and feel from friends or just kind of the vibe on the industry, how hard do you think it would be to just come in and, and start like moving your way up? How I mean, I think I, you know, I think I'd probably be able to compete relatively okay in in, in small and medium buy-ins, but but it would be really tough if I wanted to play high buy-ins again. Um, because I think I think the game's evolved, you know, so much today. I mean, it's it's a, a completely different approach is is required to, uh, to be a winning player today than than you know than when I was coming up. So so for me to really come back and and take it seriously, I think it would require uh, an immense amount of attention and kind of me you know, um, relearning a lot of the concepts that I knew and, um, it would, it would, it would be a full-time job. Uh, it would, it wouldn't be easy. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, do you, do you have, any advice? Advice. do you have any advice to someone starting today just based on what you understand or just even what you learned and what worked like buy, bankroll advice, um, any, any sort of, uh, guidance that you think that's important that what some of the key attributes you had, the intangibles, if you will, of poker that are so important you would, you would give as, you know, for, for those to focus on? Sure. I mean, I, I think I do remember that a, a lot of the, you know, on a psycho, on a psychological level, a lot, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the battle is actually with yourself. Um, and you know, how you handle losing, uh, because losing is a, is an inherent part of poker. And it's important to realize that. And, you know, a lot of people who just start out, they, you know, maybe they don't see that. Maybe they just see like, you know, top players and they feel like, okay, they're always winning. But losing is actually, you know, is really, really important. And um, something that actually my dad taught me in the very beginning when I first started playing poker was, um, you know, even though he didn't know anything about the game, he said, if you want to be a professional gambler, you have to know how to lose. As long as you can know how to lose, you know, you'll, you'll define. Uh, so, so because everyone, everyone, everyone knows how to win. Like that's that's easy. You're 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 confident. You're you're you know you're doing the right things. You're making the right moves. But when you're losing, that's when things change. And and you're, you know you're going to lose. So if you know how to lose that's that's the first step to, to becoming a pro sounds that sounds really great advice my dad that used to tell me win as if you expect it lose as if you like it like basically you know yeah when you win yeah of course i won and that's fine and no big deal and when you lose like all right no like you smile shake it off and like move move forward because i think that's where people can really prey on weakness too when you see the guy tilting like you said you might have tilted yeah. in your mind whatever you're not like pounding the table and you know visibly upset then you're kind of a target you look weak people then realize it's affecting you. Like when you see a guy get two outed with one to come in a big spot and he doesn't even, he's not even like rolling his eyes or, you know, like, like, like gives like that. Like if he's just kind of like, you know, move on and, and uh, it, you can genuinely tell it doesn't like he's showing it doesn't affect him. That's a little more scary, right? Like it's just kind of like, wow, that guy's, you know, you respect that because most people show yeah. some form of emotion. Um, so that, that's a uh, really great advice. So let's take a few more. I know we're, we're kind of, well, we've been going for a long time and there's so many questions, guys. We're going to give away this $111 ticket. I, I just know that Eugene, he's got a full schedule and he's, he's too nice a guy. He's not going to like tell me one more, <laughs> two more. So he's just going to let me go. And look at these questions, man. People want to know about class. They That's know cool. Doing. We got a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of engagement. So um, 
We're, we'll take a few more. Is that cool? Can we do a couple more and then we'll do the giveaway? Yeah, let's do it. And uh, 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 yeah, and let's... you know, I'll, I'll, if, if, there, if there is any particular question that you guys feel like we haven't addressed, you know, feel free to send it to me on Twitter and I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to answer it when I have some time, so. Um, yeah, that, that works out great. If you can, if you can do that, that's, uh, that would be, that would be very much appreciated. And in the meantime, we'll take a few more. What was the sickest downswing you had to go through? Was there ever a period where you actually were like, while you were a professional, I, I'm looking at your head and mob. I don't see many likely downswings, but was there ever like a period you kind of said you yeah. were after you won the 2.5? Was there ever a stretch where, you know, you're bricking 25 Ks, 10 Ks, and you're just like, man, it's just not, I'm not used to this. Yeah, I, that was, there was, I mean, there were many downswings. I would say the most memorable one was actually after 2011, which was, it was such a massive year for me. I was player of the year. I, I just, I was like winning everything left and right. And I was running hot. I was playing well. I mean, it was a combination of everything, right? But definitely running hot and getting lucky. Um, and I think uh, what that did to me was it actually made me overconfident. Uh, it actually made me, it made me work less on my game. I felt like I'm just, you know, <laughs> I felt like I'm just so good. I could just, you know, can just continue going. And, in 2000, and then 2012 and 2013 were some of my worst years because I literally, I was just bricking everything. And, and I didn't realize, I couldn't understand why. I was like, you know, what's going on? And, um, and it, took a look, it took a long time for me to realize that, uh, uh, that I was just, you know, I was just running good in 2011. You know, I, I, uh, and now it's time to really start working again on your game. You can't expect uh, to just, you know, stay on top of the game if you don't work on it. So that's when I kind of started to really, really learn, relearn the game and re, uh, really work on myself uh, to, to try to bring myself back. But that was a tough time. Um, you know, I lost a lot and I lost a lot of my confidence at the time. Uh, but it was a useful experience for, you know, for me in general. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's generally true for anything, but especially in poker and gaming, when you when you go through those tough times, that's where you kind of really dig in and it makes you refocus. Mm. And if you'd never have that adversity and then you get it later and it can be, you know, too much, right? Like it could be too big a drop or you might be, not be able to overcome or mentally handle it. So yeah, I think that's uh, that's really valuable. I, I just rescanned everything again. There's so many more. We'll take one more. We'll do this giveaway. Which actually, I think, I hope it works. I uh, just said it expired. Just, just, just to add, Jeff, to just to find, I think to, to what you said, I think most of the lessons that we learn in life is actually through mistakes. Most of the best lessons that we learn is, is through mistakes. I think that's really, really important. And I think maybe that's something. At least I personally didn't didn't realize uh, when I was young. So I would say maybe that's one of the you know the, the best advice I can give myself when I was young is that is that take advantage of your mistakes, take advantage of your losses, and and learn the maximum you can out of them. It's that's yeah, very true. What is what is the longest poker session? Did you ever have a two day, a twenty four hour? Did you ever? Um, yeah, maybe like a like a forty hour session, forty hour cash game. Um, I think that's probably uh, the longest I ever wanted to go to. But I've had some, yeah, I've had some long long sessions, uh, long cash game sessions. And most embarrassing poker moment? Do you ever have like a big fold out of turn? You didn't protect your cards, or oh you yeah, the wrong seat and played for oh, a while. Oh my god, give me something here. Yeah, I have I have one. I have a good one here. Um, this was I don't remember the year. This must maybe like 2012 or 13 in the Bahamas, and I'm going to play the and I'm playing the 25k high roller. Um, and uh, I, I have King Jack. Uh, I remember the hand, uh, and I'm and I'm and I'm playing against. I don't remember exactly the action, but I'm I'm, I'm up against uh, Dario Minieri, right? And um, uh, the flop was like maybe like jack nine three or something i don't remember you know some bets went in um the turn uh the turn so it's like jack there's a jack nine seven then the turn was like a like a uh like a jack and then the river was a seven right so so i have i have a jack so which makes you know jacks full of sevens um and then we were really deep and I remember the action but i remember i put out a big bet in the river and dario raised me all in and the way the way, he was so confident, and the way he played his hand was like I was just like, oh my god, he has quads! Like he just has to have quads! Like there's, no, there's just nothing, you know, there's nothing else. And I show a jack, and I fold, I le and I leave my other card behind, and he like, you know, he shows pocket nines, right? I don't know why he went all in, but he had pocket nines, and my hand was dead, even though I showed one card, and I and I because I mucked the other one, so that was probably like the most embarrassing moment where, you know, it was a humongous pot. I throw out the best hand. I tried to make a good fold. It was like a retarded fold. It ended up being a retarded fold. And my hand is dead, even though I showed one card. And I and I threw out the other one. So it was just a really painful experience. I felt really, really stupid. Like, you know, after that, I was like, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> 
That must have cost me like I don't know, like forty k in equity, fifty k in equity. Wow, that's uh, damn. Well, I mean, listen, you play a long time. You play. There's, you know, I you knew you had one because right away you did. It wasn't you had to think. You just went right to it. So yeah, hopefully, yeah. Hopefully that was like the one that that stood out. Uh, all right, last one. Biggest goal in life. What's a? Give me something that, that currently a goal. Something that you're working toward or that would be really important for you uh, or, or that you you strive for. My biggest goal in life is to to build something I think I can be really, really proud of, uh, you know, when I'm older, when I'm 50, when I'm 60, to build something that I feel like really uh, I that I brought something to the world that brought some value um, and uh, and something I can, you know, tell my future kids about uh, and be proud of. And it looks like I mean, so Clash, that's that's your, your that's so, the like, thing. Your, Result, yeah. result oriented or not, I mean, at this point, like you, it's, 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 it's safe to say you've built something you've got, you've put, how many years now have you been working on this project? Over four now, over four years. So, so. over, four, over four years, um, uh, it's, it's, it, it, I mean, it's like, again, whatever happens, whether you hit that big sale, the multiple, this goes, it go, however it goes, it's, uh, it's pretty safe to say. I mean, you've got to be proud of it, right? No matter what happens. And obviously, it'd be great if you hit that big score and multiple. Yeah. Uh, well, but you you built something. Like this is something that you put a big, good portion of your you know prime of your life, right? In your mid thirties. Yeah. Um. And prime and, of life and prime of my resources as well, and my mine and Luca's resources. And you know, I think that's the thing that that also I think that's you know that skin in the game is really really important. Um. And uh, you know, it's it's uh. Um, we, we feel like we're going to make it one way or another. So, uh, uh, we're just trying to, we're just trying to make sure it's going to be as successful, uh, as it can be. Right. Yeah. That's, uh, that, that's, that's, I mean, I love your, I love your chances and, and, uh, I love that I'm, you know, riding a little bit of a, a tiny sweat along sure. the way. It's fun. It's fun. So I'll, I'm looking forward and to that. It. That's, that's the other thing I want to, I want to make, I want to make you guys proud. I want to make you guys proud in terms of, you know, believing in us because I know, just you, just like Daniel, just like Phil, you didn't invest in the business idea. You invested more in me and Luca as 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 people, as believing that that we can actually, um, we are capable of building something uh, something big, or adapting uh, towards the industry and building something big eventually. So, I do. You know, Luca and I both really, really appreciate that trust from you guys, from you know, from our, all our other investors, and you know, and and our future investors. And um, I think, uh, you know, I do fantasize about the day that I could. That I could show. See, guys, you made the right bet, and you know, write you a big check. <laughs> that would be really cool. I absolutely love it. Well, I am trying to do this giveaway, and I actually—it's uh, bizarre because I—I I have it's my man DMP3 who Austin. He's on been on the podcast. Really has a cool program here for this retweet uh, picker. But uh, I think my thing, which he gave me a credit, I'm gonna have to try to do this. He, like he he set it up for me, and I am uh, unfortunately it looks like I could be. I mean, I don't know. He's gonna have to reset it. I don't. I, I'm. I'm messaging him right now. I can't remember the name of. Uh, what's the name of this? We're gonna try to get. It. Like, let's do one more question. Give me while I try to load this up. If I can't get it, I will just do it manually. Actually, you know what? We don't need that. We could do it. We could do it the old school way because it's not working right now. So, which yeah. is, let's do it this way. We'll just have fun and we'll just we'll just scroll through it and I'll uh, I'll pick one. So you just close your eyes and tell me when in a, in a second. I'm gonna start. All right. Scrolling. Go ahead. I, go, I close my eyes. Tell me, uh, okay. Now. First big poker win right here. Bella Simon is going to win it. Going to send him a message. Congrats. He got, that's running good because it was going to be done another way. It's done the manual way. You just won. <laughs> I will message you. It looks like, oh, he's won 109 ticket and a 55 ticket. His third giveaway. Wow. You guys have all the luck, man. But uh, yeah, I appreciate you, Gene. This was very informative. Really, uh, it's really good to to uh, catch up, man. I, I definitely, you know, I love the space, love what you're doing, love being a part of it. And I think uh, you got a lot of fans here. You can see by the engagement on your, on Twitter, there's a lot of people want to know what's going on and checking in. If you do have time, go ahead and uh, yeah, answer a few of the questions yeah. you see if we didn't get to them, but we did cover a lot and uh, yeah, man, hope to uh, link up soon at a live stop, maybe a Triton 100 K in a few years when we're, we're just, uh, yeah. you know, things are moving. So yeah. yeah man, thank you, that. Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, for, you know, it was a really, really fun interview. And uh, thank you for all the, you know, uh, for the community for watching and for asking all the questions. Uh, it's really, really cool to see to see people are kind of interested in asking all these questions. And I, and I will try to get to them on Twitter uh, once I'm off here. But this was fun. Let's do it again. And um, and I'm happy to, you know, bring some of our, you know, esports superstars on your podcast if you'd like. So let me know. Yeah. And uh, 
So let's that, do it. That would, be, that would be a treat. That would that would really be cool if you gave me a couple names of uh, guys that uh, would would like to be on. You know, check with them, see if they're interested. I, I would leave it at your discretion because again, it's something I'm not as familiar with. So you uh, you tell me who you think would would uh, you'd like to have on and, and that are good from there, and, that, and let's do it. So awesome, man. I appreciate Sounds it. Sounds good. Thank you, enjoy enjoy over there. I hope everything uh, keeps going well, and, and we'll see each other soon. Talk to you later, Jeff. Take care. All right, guys. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Eugene Katzlov, number 128. Follow him on Instagram, Twitter. Uh, you can fl- follow Clash.gg and all the other different things. They do a lot of giveaway. Well, they do giveaways. They do they do content. They do gaming. They got the mobile app. So check out Clash. And we did show that again. I'm just going to scroll over here and show you guys. You can go to the website. That is Clash.gg slash en. You got the Clash, Team Clash on uh, Twitter. There's an Instagram. And they got a lot of content, guys. So again, we appreciate yeah. Eugene's time, and we will see you very soon. We got a podcast tomorrow, 2 p.m. with my man Pomp. He is a media mogul. He's got his own. Basically, I don't even know how to describe him. The guy just has amazing content. We're gonna get to chat with him and talk to him tomorrow. But again, thanks, Eugene. We'll see you guys tomorrow at 2 p.m. Thanks, Jeff. Bye, guys.